In today's episode, Tara and I talk about the nearly universal phenomena called the post-relationship love bomb. Yes, that's our word for it. It's when the abusive person circles back and says, can't we just be friends? We're going to talk about why we think this is happening and what you can do about it. And the self-help tip is about the importance of communicating some information as information and not needing to have the other person's buy-in. Thank you for joining us on Breaking Free with Carrie and Tara, the podcast where we talk about strategies, tips, and tricks for navigating and recovering from toxic relationships. I'm your host, Dr. Carrie Kerr McAvoy, a mental health specialist with over 20 years of counseling experience and the author of Love You More, an inside graphic look at my survival of a narcissistic relationship. And I'm your other host, Tara Blair Ball, certified relationship coach, abuse survivor, and author of Reclaim and Recover, Heal from Toxic Relationships with the Seven Step Guided Journal. We're thrilled that you're here with us today. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes and leave us a review and let us know what you think of the show. You know, there comes a point in a relationship when it's going south and they've been disillusioned with you for a while. You're feeling their criticism or whatever. And often the toxic or narcissistic person has moved on. Maybe they've moved on months ahead, weeks ahead, but then there comes the moment that they are done and they actually discard, reject, or just walk out. It is a tough moment, but what's interesting is, and I hear this a lot from from those who've been following me or leave comments or get in touch with me is that, and I experienced it myself, is that the person that does the leaving often will come back and do some kind of a connecting gesture, like let's be friends, or I hope <laughs> we'll always stay in touch, or, or you know, it, it would be great if we once in a while could go out. Have you heard this or seen this? Is this something that's happening a lot with the clients or the people that you work with, Tara? Yes. <laughs> yes. So I don't think it's common. I don't think it's, I don't think it's rare. I think it's common, whether it is a toxic, narcissistic, abusive relationship. I think it's common for us to see this, but it's even more damaging and important that we avoid it and know how to respond well, if it's a toxic, abusive or narcissistic relationship. So what you're saying, I want to make sure I heard you correctly, because I know that you've done dating, coaching for dating. So you've seen a lot of breakups, I'm sure. You're right. saying that it's common for people after a breakup of some kind to circle back and say, hey, I'd like to have some kind of contact lesson is not just cut it off. I'm, I'm not saying you're out of my life. I would like to have you in my life at some fashion, some form. You're saying that's common. That happens a lot. Yes. Yes. Almost in a way that seems extreme. For example, I talked with a man, never went on a date with him. And he sent me a message literally a year later saying, Mm. Hey, let's, let's hang out. (laughs) So yes, uh, it's extremely common. Okay. So let's talk about why do we think it happens in general and then what's happening specifically when it's been an abusive relationship? Because I think I think there's there's similar dynamics, but I also think there's different dynamics. And and it, so yeah, here's what I think. And I and I know you had a lot of experience in this area, but my 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 gut as a psychologist says that the reason that we're doing this is to let the person down easy, and, mm-hmm. and also because we we fear hurting and causing injury, and so we don't really. It's our way of patching them up. It's like throwing a bandage on. It's like I know I hurt you, but here I'm trying to soothe it over so it's not so bad. Or it may. So that's one reason. Or it may be due to a fear of abandonment themselves that they hate feeling cutoffs and losses, and so they're trying to say, I still have a connection. It may not be the same connection, but it's a connection. So it's sort of almost like an effort to soothe themselves in some form or fashion, and maybe even soothe the partner who they're doing it with. Those are things that kind of off the top of my head come to mind. What do you think? What what seems to be the reasons that people do this in general? Now, I I agree with you. I do think we need to reframe it a little bit because both of those ways are still manipulative and selfish, you know, because really the first one comes from I I want to patch it up. I want to provide a Band-Aid for you because I don't want to deal with your uncomfortable feelings. Mm. Yeah. I, so way, it's I very. Saying, yeah. I wasn't saying it was a good thing or a bad thing. I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying this is yeah. why I think psychologically people do it. But you're right. It is a manipulative right. thing. Yeah. And I, 
I do want to add that sometimes it is because that that person, your ex, may have provided something to you that no one else had. You know, maybe you had something in common that was special or they provided a valuable insight for you that you don't want to lose that person wholly because you did find something about your connection with them as being unique. Yeah. 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 I, I, do you think it's a bad practice? Are you saying it shouldn't happen even if it's even if it's not a dysfunctional, even if it was relatively healthy dating, it just like was not a good match, didn't work out. Do you think that's you saying don't do this? I personally say don't do this. Mm. And I know a lot of people who feel absolutely differently, but I think it also really comes back to how was the relationship? Like if you'd been friends for 10 years, dated for a month, you know, the romantic part, yes, had happened, but it was such a small part of that overall relationship. But if you dated 10 years and were only friends for a month, that's not quite the same. And I personally, I don't see a reason to stay really connected. I can see, I can see being a, a friendly acquaintance, like you see him, like, hey, how's it going? But after an extended period of time, like you've done no contact, that kind of thing, I really just see it valuable as just having a distance. There's a reason why that relationship ended romantically. And it can be difficult to really remove all of those feelings or the resentment or anger. And so sometimes it's best just left in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing that worries me, I agree with you. The thing that worries me is I think that it opens the door for these quasi squishy i don't know what we really are but we're something relationships mm -hmm. where then there's also usually some form of intimacy it just ends up to me being murky muddy and 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 not healthy it is it's because it's, it's not good boundaries to it there's a lack of closure to it right and it can be that idea that you're keeping someone on the back burner too it can be, you know yeah. and i I have been kept on the back burner in a similar way. Like I, I had saw no reason to not stay friends, but then it did get murky when this person sharing things with me that really they should have been sharing with their romantic partner instead, or they were viewing me as sort of a therapist or their emotional support, which that opens the door for emotional infidelity. And I don't want to be anyone's side piece. And I hope no one listening would want to be, be either. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, that was my first thought. Yeah, you're right. It, it really, open it lends itself to emotional infidelity and i i think we don't call that out enough we don't talk about that enough that that it, that's a very toxic relationship it makes it bothers me when i hear people say to me yeah and i'm still friends with my exes and i'm like well how's that working and friends what with benefits or what what is what do you right. mean when you mean when you say that you know yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's kind of edgy but but i think it moves into a whole different category when we're talking about abuse particularly narcissistic abuse this is super common. It, it's almost like there's a playbook that people seem to pull out. And then <laughs> I'm amazed the similarities of even what's said. And what mine said was, I still have the text. Can we be friends? I hope we can be friends going forward in the future or something like that. And then they usually do something like you've been so helpful. I mean, some kind of like, again, this soothing patching thing about what you've done for their life or whatever, and or who you've been to them. Why do you think people are doing that after? Why why wouldn't a predatory or abusive person do that after a toxic relationship? Well, as we talked about earlier, the back burner, okay? Keeping people hooked. You want your supply lined up. You never want to be without a supply. And you can't depend on whatever supply you have currently. So you need a bunch of old supplies lined up. So that's the hard part too, is recognizing that you're not special. They're going to make you feel special. Like you're the only one they talk to about this thing, but you're not. And that's the nature of that, that narcissistic abuse is that they have, you are one of many that they have lined up because they cannot be without a supply. They need that for themselves. And Carrie think we should delete that text message <laughs> i just think we should get rid of that <laughs> oh no 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 for me that's evidence i'm using you know you know it i have because of the book i have evidence okay all right yeah, yeah, yeah. no 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 this is, no it's not something i go back in fact i forgot it was there honestly it, it isn't something i go back and revisit because it brings warm feelings to me it's more oh, to me yeah. it's like you got to be you got to be kidding me. This is right. He's crazy to think that I would want that. Seriously? I mean, that's a lot. Right. Yeah, exactly. But but 
here's the thing that I know that's so tough, and that is those that are being discarded, and I'm, I'm speaking more to those who have had a sudden walkout or a, or a discard that came rather unexpected, they're still very emotionally invested in this relationship. And I, at, at that moment, I was too. And it, and it felt like like a relief, like like hopeful, like that that this I still had meaning to this person. It, it really because it, it's that person out that personal connection. So I think the thing that that what you just said is so it's accurate. I 100 percent agree with you. But boy, is that cruel to accept. Mm -hmm. It feels so harsh to realize that it's back to that you were nothing more than an object. You know, one of the past episodes, it was the second episode, I think, or the third, you talked about where it was episode three of this season. You talked about that we being no more than a, an iPhone, that that when we objectify somebody, we need to remember we were never human, we were an object. And, that, and then you made this really powerful statement about how do you turn the perspective of seeing someone in a in a personal, humane way when they've only ever been an iPhone or an object. I'll tell you, Tara, that was that like turned my world. And that I think is the mindset we need to have when we see these kind of communications of this person smirked at your jokes. They've talked about you behind your back. They've made massive betrayals. They may have laid hands on you, and now they want a friendship with you or continued contact with you. No, no, no. This is the same selfish motive that has always been there. This is just, even though it feels nice, this is just more manipulation. But I'll tell you, that's that's hard to hear that at a heart level. So hard. And I think you're right, too, that this is just another opportunity for further abuse. I can see it definitely as an opportunity for the toxic abuse of narcissistic ex to rewrite the narrative of your relationship and to do some gaslighting. Like it wasn't that big of a deal or we were such a good fit or we were such good partners, friends, etc. It is that opportunity to continually be psychologically abused by being gaslighted to, You're pretend, right. to pretend that the reality of your relationship that hurt you, devastated you, wasn't really the case. You're and if you... I'm blown. You, my mind's blown. My mind's blown. <laughs> sure. I'm sorry. It's like, you're right. That's gaslighting. And if you agree to be friends, you're agreeing to their narrative. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And for those who are unfamiliar with gaslighting, it is to sub substitute their reality for yours, which then says that you're either too sensitive, you're too emotional, or you're crazy. You're right. It, you're right. You're, they're saying when they do that, oh, we're just leaving things well. I didn't just ditch you. I didn't just throw you for somebody else. I'm still that good woman or that great guy. Wow. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And it's hard. It can make it even harder for you as a victim or survivor of abuse for anyone to believe you when they can then use, well, we were friends after we broke up. You know, like it's something they can continue to use against you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you're right. It's what it's there. What they will be weaponized. It will absolutely. be. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Wow. So what do you recommend to people when they get that? I, you know, back to we talked last week about no contact to me that first of all, I would hope that text doesn't come in or that email doesn't come in that you've already blocked them everywhere. So but if it does. I think that that's a that's a sure sign you need to be going no contact if you if possible. Do you have other thoughts about what to do? I have a couple. The first thing I would suggest is if you haven't blocked, wait to respond. Okay? That's got to be the first one. You got to wait to respond. And w you also need to go into the expectation that this might happen. And as you said earlier in the episode, it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen. Expect that it's going to happen and prepare for it you know, so block, etc. you know, but you may realize you haven't blocked them everywhere. They sent you on, they sent you an email that you'd forgotten that you had, et cetera. And they send it, you may get it somehow. So when you see it, if you choose to read it at that time, take, take some time before you respond. Um, I think it can be really helpful to have someone even read it before you do. You know, when you see the name, the email, or the name come through or whatever, or you see the text message, have a friend read it first and maybe tell you what it's going to say. 
mm. and see see how you feel hearing it from someone else's mouth first. But take some time to respond because your impulse might be, especially if you're hurting and you're missing and you're you're feeling a lot of pain of you might jump to say yes. You you know what I mean? Of course, like yeah, you want to have you don't want to feel discarded. You don't want to feel abandoned. You don't want to feel any of that. So your impulse might be to say yes. Again, I'm going to f- encourage you to pause, okay? And see maybe if another friend can advise you or anything like that and make some suggestions from that. But your end result should always be don't respond. What they want, any any attempt at love bombing or trauma bond or anything is they want an emotional reaction from you. And the best thing you can do for yourself and for whatever is happening in that moment is to not give any kind of emotional reaction at all. It's not your time to attack or be like, why are you so ridiculous? Or of course, and try to define what this friendship is going to look like. None of that is going to work for you. Yeah. We're not dealing with a sane person. You can't, you can't be sane with, with an insane person. And so you just need to be absent. You need to be gone. Just no reaction, nothing whatsoever. And they may keep pushing, you know, like, oh, you're not answering me. You're not going to respond to me. Why can't we be friends? We have these mutual friends. What are we going to do? Not speak in front of them. Who knows whatever they're going to say. Your job always is to not have a reaction. Nothing. Yeah. I love that because one of the things people don't realize is that most interactions with people who have a personality disorder or a higher end, they're we're more pathological. Communication, the point of communication is not actually any resolution or any ability to work things out. It's simply to create drama and chaos. And the minute we respond, it's like we stepped into a bear trap. We we have we have entered into the fray and they have already snapped it close on us and they have won. So I agree. It's it's so important. I, I know that. There's a strong urge for us to feel misunderstood, for f- to feel understood, for us to to correct the the mis mis. Um, sometimes they they say things. The narrative is wrong, and we want to correct the story because it feels unfair to us. Uh, maybe we also just want to have closure. I get that, but but it's that's not that's not a feasible it's not a feasible thing in these communication. Uh, dialogues. It's just, it's, we step into a trap when we do this. Yeah. And we need to avoid that trap. We need to see it for what it is and not step into it. And which means not responding in any way, shape or form. And if we hadn't already blocked him, go ahead and do so. Yeah. 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 I know that I did respond and then it quickly fell apart. So the chances are, <laughs> chances are, if you do do it, you're going to find that you're not on the same page anyway. You're going to find that that's not what they meant or they're going to end up pulling all the things that they pulled out the first time to get you back into the, get you into the relationship they're going to attempt to do to get you back into the relationship and then we all know what that means is that it's worse it will be worse the next time because you're signing off on everything every abusive thing they've ever done to you yeah and i think it's important too to just recognize the fact that even if they tell you that they've changed right a person is only going to change about 15% i know okay yeah. That's based on them working with someone like a therapist, counselor, coach, or whatever for six months to a year. That's the yeah. only way you could see actual lasting, meaningful, impactful change is that they're doing something and they've done that something for an extended period of time. So you broke up like last week and suddenly they want to be friends. You are signing up to get the same old, same old. Yeah, because that time has not happened and chances are they've done no work at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right, right. Yeah. And it's such a good point that you also made that they they have such a need for whatever supply. And we often use the word supply thinking it's admiration or it's adoration or some kind of positive. But supply also comes in the form of fights, conflict, antagonism. So they may just want to fight with you. That that may be the way that they know that they exist and that brings them some kind of sadistic pleasure. So yeah, we we need to see that we need to not offer ourselves as supply on any level. Mm-hmm. We're not iPhones. No, we're not iPhones. No, I'm not. Mm-hmm. A- not yeah. today. <laughs> not today. Well, it's fascinating. I hadn't really thought about the post breakup relationship. Like, let's be friends because I don't. I didn't date and have friendships with people. I mean, 
my relationships, when they ended, they were like endings, you know? So I, I didn't know that was a common thing that happens in a lot of relationships. That's fascinating to me. It does. I saw it so often with dating and the term has become haunting. This might be where you, you know, you, d- you never had anything serious. It may have just been casual, but then the person keeps showing up on your Instagram stories or they send you a random DM or it's a random text. And it could be months, even years after the fact when you'd never had anything. And I think it's similar to the whole wanting to keep people lined up. So if you get lonely, so if whatever, you've got someone there for you to, to latch on to. And I don't want to be anybody's second, third, fourth, fifth choice. I just, that's not for me today. Yeah. I, I often think it like thinking of strings on a football team. I don't really want to be the third or fourth string player. I don't, I want to be first string or I'm out and I'm not interested in that. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I do think it helps. It does help to do no, it, once it's over, go immediately, no contact. I think that kind of prevent, but they will, they're good at finding some little, like, no, they're almost like mice. They find little holes and fit themselves through. It's amazing how they do that. And that's the hard part with mutual friends. I think mm-hmm. having boundaries with mutual friends can be some of the most difficult part because they might be invested in the drama too, or they might be believing your ex's narrative and not more totally want to side with you. They may not be a true friend to you. And that's part of the reason why it can be really difficult having a breakup too, is you may find that nobody seems to really be in your corner anymore. You know, it's not just that that relationship ended. It's a multiple of relationships. And that was the case for me. I don't have a relationship with my family as a result, my immediate family as a result of my divorce. I I lost a lot of mutual friendships. And those are choices that were really good for me to make and necessary for me to make. But they were super painful for me to make in the time because I felt more alone, more, more isolated. And when you're like that, it can make you hunger for any kind of connection or okay. But We have to stick to it and stay strong because it's, it may help us in the short term. It's devastating to us in the long term. You're so right. And and so many of these relationships, I I liken it to a volcano blast. It blows out all the relationships in our lives, not just that relationship, but you're right. We lose the in-laws or their family. We lose, we lose the mutual friends that we shared. And we may discover that we've had a habit of allowing friends in our lives that are not very healthy. So we have to retake a look at that as well. So it's this massive. So when you get this, it's like almost like an olive branch. It feels like, oh, finally, I'm not completely alone. But yeah, really watch out for it. It's dangerous. It is, mm-hmm. it is not an olive branch. It is a pipe bomb and it will, uh, go, off. Yep. It will go off. Yeah. Well, this is an interesting topic today. I'm glad we talked about it. And I know it's un- pretty, I would bet it's universal. I yes. have a feeling it's like nearly a hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. And I think you and I are pretty much in agreement on how to handle them. And I hope our listeners are, are, are with us too. <laughs> yeah, I do too. I do too. Remember pipe bomb, pipe bomb. Nah, nah. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Today's self-help tip is about the importance of communicating some things as simply information and not looking for a person's buy-in. Many of us are by nature cooperative people, and so we like to treat projects and information as though it's a collaboration. That makes sense. If you're in a joint household and you're doing things together, you may want to make plans about what your next trip is going to be or what you're going to do for dinner or going out on Friday night. But when it comes to boundaries, this is different. That has to do with the communication of who you are, your likes and dislikes. And in those situations, we don't need a person's buy-in. Take, for example, my strong dislike for liver and onions. I find that so disgusting. I don't even want to be in the house when it's being cooked. I don't need your buy-in. If I'm saying to you, hey, if you really want to have liver and onions, go at it. But I'm going to actually not be around for the evening. I don't need that person's buy-in. I just simply need to, to relay the information. So when it comes to giving information, consider whether or not this is actually a project where you need the person's cooperation or whether you're just communicating something that's important about you. 
The post-split love bomb or offers of friendship can be really tempting. Have you fallen for these before? What has been your experience? Let us know and make sure to try to see communication as informing instead of getting buy-in or resolution. If you haven't yet, make sure to follow or subscribe, write us a review. And if you know someone who would benefit from this episode, make sure to share it with them. If you're not following us on social media yet, you can find me on Instagram at tara.relationshipcoach or carrie at carrie McAvoy PhD. We'll see you back here next Monday, where we'll be talking about the best ways to co-parent with a toxic or narcissistic ex.